Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We are building a community of people who want to understand how to positively apply behavioral science to their work and life. We achieve this by having fun and engaging conversations with a wide variety of people, like our guest today, Liz Fosline. Liz is the co-author, along with Molly West Duffy, an illustrator of the book, No Hard Feelings, The Secret Power of Embracing Emotions at Work. Liz focuses on helping companies improve their corporate culture, and she recently joined Humo to help organizations use nudges to drive behavior change that makes their work better. You know, we didn't know much about Liz prior to our, our session. Uh, you know, her book hadn't come out yet, and we, we, we did get a galley of it, but we didn't have much background on her, so there was a little bit of trepidation going into it. But that concern was vanquished as soon as we started talking with her. And we read the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the conversation, like all of our conversations, jumped around from topic to topic. From her workout music, her background in math and economics, to 14 ways an economist says I love you. My love, your supply simply exceeds my demand. Okay, that was really creepy. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going on, just ignoring that. Uh, we talked about burnout, the burnout that led to the book, to the research and the findings that the book explores, to the Oreo method of feedback. Oreos. Yeah. They're in the basement, right? Yes, they are. We, <laughs> okay. I keep the Oreos in the basement because I eat them too much. Now I'm saying. thinking about Oreos. Right, there you go. However, there were a few key areas uh, from the conversation that we explore in detail in our grooving session. One is the overarching concept that our emotions can play a positive role at work for a variety of reasons. And the second is about how to deal with the limits or restrictions that we sometimes place on ourselves in the workplace. We talked about how these impact us, our productivity, and our emotional health. And we also groove on psychological safety. Yes, Tim. It rears its head again. Loved it. <laughs> and how emotions are contagious. Uh, we groove on tears for fears. Yeah. And songwriting. So we had a lot to talk about in our grooving session. Because we are both songwriters now. Oh, there we go. We are working hard to make behavioral grooves the best that it can be. We want to expand this community of people who are interested in positively applying behavioral science to work and life. And really, that's kind of all that matters. We would be grateful if you could help us expand that community by recommending this or another Behavioral Grooves episode to a friend. Surely, you're not the only one that you know who might appreciate this podcast. You don't have to call me Shirley. <laughs> also, sorry. Also, if you are interested in connecting with Tim or me, uh, we can be reached on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Our Twitter and LinkedIn handles will be shown in the show notes. We would love to start a conversation, so please feel free to reach out. And now, please sit back and let your emotions run free as you listen to our conversation with Liz Fosline. Liz Fosline, welcome to the Behavioral Grooves podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Good. We are excited to have you. We are too. We'd like to start with a little speed round. Unicycle or bicycle? Unicycle. Ooh, all right. Off your tea. <laughs> Coffee. Travel with a set itinerary or no itinerary? No itinerary. All right. Workout to EDM music or Bob Dylan? EDM music. <laughs> All right. So we, we might have to we're going to have to, start, we're gonna have to start with music, Kurt. We might. Are we going to start with music? All right. So help us understand why working out to EDM versus like beautiful, wonderful Bob Dylan or whoever else it is that you you listen to? Yeah. So I have run experiments on myself. Uh, I usually do like elliptical or treadmill. And so I look at things like strides per hour, um, or I actually don't even know what it means. It's like some three letters and it's just an indicator. Like if I go faster, the number goes up. So, I just love that number. <laughs> um, so those are my two measures. And then, yeah, I've tested Podcasts, so podcast at normal speed, podcast at 2x. Um, okay. And then, yeah, like songs that I like, which would be like a Bob Dylan, a uh, Cat Stevens, but they tend to be a little slower. And mm -hmm. then I've also tested EDM, which is just like heart racing, pumping music. And a lot of dance music. There you go. Yes. Yep. 
and the EDM, 25% more strides per hour, which to me was convincing enough. So now I just, I have an actual playlist and it's just like top 40 EDM. So I don't, it's just <laughs> it's like automatically updated each day. So yeah, I have a very uh, in-depth knowledge of what's hot in the EDM scene. <laughs> The, the, yeah, and you listen to that all the other times, right? Or that is not what you're listening to, correct? That's not what I'm listening to. <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, okay. Well, we could go way down the. Well, the there's music there part. is some definite priming. Uh, you, you know, I think there's yeah. probably just beats and rhythms that you're going with and various different things, but some priming components with that. I, well, it's really, right. it's really context. I, I mean, it's really difficult to to think that blowing in the wind or. Uh, you know, Bob Dylan's blues or, you know, even Hurricane or, you know, any, any of those songs are going to actually have a, a, a driving effect on your workout. It's just, it's just difficult. Yeah, they're really nice. So if I run outside there, it's really nice if it's just like a slow kind of for the beauty of the world, like a spiritual experience. But if I have like 45 minutes at the gym, Bob Dylan's not going to do it for me. <laughs> how did how did podcasts do? Were they oh, were, were horrible, you lower or? horrible, horrible, horrible? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we might well, have to. On, a, on right. elliptical, they're good, but for running, yeah, I think I get distracted by the podcast, or I don't know. Somehow, I think my retention is also much lower because I'm doing more things. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> We might have to edit that out. Yes, you know, I will say, I will say the actual though, behavioral grooves the podcast. The just was speeding down. The <laughs> Who knows? Who yeah. knows? You'll have, to, you'll have to give it a try. All right. Okay, but let, let's. We're, we're not here. We are not here explicitly to talk about music. We're here to talk about your new book, No Hard Feelings. So, what's first? The, the story behind how. You got to the point to write the book, I think is fascinating. Can you share with our listeners a little background on what what caused you to write the book? Yeah, so I, again, have a, an undergraduate uh, degree in economics and then math and went to work as an economic consultant after I graduated. And it was this job that I always thought I wanted. Um, I was there for a while and then was, I guess I'll describe the work I was doing because I think it's relevant to the story. Uh, it was after the financial crisis, Lehman Brothers had just gone bankrupt and defaulted on AAA rated corporate bonds. So a lot of pensioners had invested in those bonds thinking that they were a solid investment. Uh, when Lehman Brothers defaulted, those pensioners lost a lot of their money. And so my job or the case that I was on again was to prove that Lehman Brothers owed no one money, that the bankruptcy was unforeseeable, and therefore they hadn't violated any of the terms of the contract. Um, so I think it wasn't like deeply soul-warming work. Um, and then, yeah, I think I've always had an artistic side that I squelched in, in the pursuit of like the tall building business suit version of success. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think the combination of like no creativity in that work and then the case, I just completely burnt out of that job. And it was the first time in my life that I looked to the future and there was just a void. There wasn't like a do this, do that, kind of here's how you ascend. Um, and so that really led me to just look backwards and try and understand what was it about the work I was doing that was unfulfilling to me? And then what was I doing that was harming myself. Like I just, I was very anxious when I left, I was having headaches all the time. So there was obviously on my end, I wasn't managing my own internal state very well at all. Um, and then that combination of just started really looking into psychology research. Um, also just every, you know, everything, mindfulness, academic, uh, uh, experiments coming out of academia and that kind of combination of like, what is the kind of work that really drives us? And what can we do when work inevitably is hard? Because even if you love your job, it's not always wonderful to jump out of bed and like take meetings all day. No. Um, and that was really the impetus for the kind of the, the research and the thesis of the book, which is that you're going to have feelings. It's biologically impossible to shut that off. So we need to start learning how to, to deal with them. So find it fascinating that a math and econ major is also the illustrator for this. And you mentioned that you 
love to doodle your entire life. But I mean, uh, help out people, help our listeners understand a little bit more about that and how that came about from this. Yeah. So I've always, again, like, like, like I said, love doodling and then started during this time when I was trying to do a lot of internal reflection and process everything that I was feeling, just put my feelings into charts. Um, yeah. So it would be like, today I feel good. And then here are all the things that I did that day. And like, what's correlated with me feeling good. Um, and then that branched out into just doing little charts or, or, or pie charts, line charts of um, just experiences I'd had. So I did a job interview in charts, like what it's like to be an analyst in charts. And then that led to a project called 14 Ways an Economist Says I Love You, which was taking kind of the core econ 101 charts and turning them into Valentines. So one was like the marginal returns of spending time with you will never diminish. Um, <laughs> they're just like really nerdy. And then those actually, some econ bloggers uh, posted, like Greg Mankiw, uh, Tyler Cowan at Marginal Revolution, they posted them on Valentine's Day. And I think it was just like the perfect, like weird, you know, uh, group of people on the perfect day. And so those went viral. And that kind of led me then to get a book agent who said that this combination of like charts and just a little infusing these topics with humor plus research could be a compelling book. So my, my favorite one is the, uh, uh, of the 14 ways an economist says I love you in the charts is the S&P was in red, but I wasn't blue because I shorted the market, but went long on you. And you have a nice <laughs> little graph of, of S&P and then you. Uh, that's very cute. So, Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful idea, right? And, and so it comes and, in. And of course, you didn't stop there. I mean, that was really just the catalyst to actually start the interviewing process, right? To actually start the research for the book, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So the book, it really started. Um, I also, so I got a book agent after kind of those charts went viral and just sat on that opportunity for a while. And then my friend, uh, Molly West Duffy, who's now my co-author, we started writing articles. She was at Parsons at the time, Parsons at the time doing a lot of organizational design research and just had such an easy time writing together that we decided to do the book together. And it was really and coming from an economics background. Um, it was to me really important to start with the research. And so there's actually a website called National Affairs and they have their findings section. Um, every day they post on a topic, just like six to nine abstracts related to that topic. And so I thought that that for me was like, I did that. I just went there and looked at everything having to do with emotion, everything having to do with management, teamwork, and just read through all those abstracts, pulled out the ones I thought were interesting. Then I contacted, um, I live in the Bay Area, so I contacted people at Berkeley, then went out to Boston and talked to people at HBS, uh, just to kind of get a sense of like, what is the, the best research that's being done? And then they pointed me to other places. But it was really important, again, to start with academia, like what what is the research bear out? And then later in the process, we interviewed about like 50 Fortune 500 executives, a lot of them heads of talent, um, people analytics, HR, trying to understand, you know, I, th I think sometimes, unfortunately, there's a discrepancy between what's going on in academia, and then what's actually being implemented in the workplace. And so I wanted to see what was working, what was not like, just have both of those viewpoints. Um, and then hopefully in the book, try and meld that all into like, here's just a really actionable, practical guide to doing something that's research backed, but also probably going to work <laughs> in like the real world with all these other things going on. So help our listeners understand the what the book is about, what are some of the key elements that you discuss in the book and, and what they can take away from it? Yeah, so the book is about taking down this idea that it's possible to check your feelings at the door when you enter an office. Um, we are emotional creatures regardless of circumstance. Um, so it's given that it's biologically impossible not to feel. So we should start learning how to utilize that in the workplace. Um, so big, big takeaways are not every feeling is a fact. Uh, I think it's really important for people once they've acknowledged what they're feeling in a moment to be able to parse out 
this is noise and this is actually a relevant emotion that contains valuable data. So mm. how do you start that process? Um, also, there's, you know, the workplace is different than your personal life. So there's this big push, especially where I'm from, you know, the Bay Area has a lot of tech companies for work to be a family and you should be vulnerable. But what does that practically mean? Um, and especially if you're a leader, just full disclosure can weaken how people view you. They, it undermines your ability to lead. And so really giving people a guide map to how do you be authentic? How much emotion should you express? Also, depending on kind of your place in the organization. Um, so I think those are the two biggest things. It's just like figuring out which emotions you should listen to and what you can take from them. And then how do you express those emotions effectively at work? And you do it with some wonderful illustrations and some other fun kind of little caveats within there. So um, I think it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that struck me about, um, about a lot of uh, there, there seems to be an underlying underlying issue around trust, right? Mm -hmm. You talk about feedback and how it's important for, uh, for us to get feedback that might not always feel good. Right. But yeah. Right. This is this is a, a, a central part of of the story, or and that that's based on trust. I feel like for, for us to be able to hear something that doesn't conform with the way that we like to see ourselves, with our with our self schema, our self identity, that uh, that we're going to have to have some trust with the person who's giving us that feedback. Right. Definitely. Um, and I think that that then goes to again showing the importance of emotion there's research that shows that if you are not able to have kind of the correct emotional response to a given situation if you're just the exact same person across every single area so like there's layoffs and you're totally fine people don't yeah. trust you because they perceive you as a robot and especially if you're a leader um you know they, they people already assume they're being marketed to if you're a leader and so if you never display anything, they just very much don't trust you. So even when we're talking about something like feedback, again, it goes into goes back to like how much emotion are you expressing? And it is important that you express some emotion to form those bonds with other people. Yeah, you did a nice little article, too, um, on the feedback that doesn't hold a punch. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. With cookies as a metaphor. <laughs> Um, and again, doodles around those, which are wonderful. I had an Oreo and the black and white and the oatmeal cookie is kind of metaphors for types of feedback. Yeah, we um, do. So there's a common one in the business world that I kept coming across was the Oreo method, which is one nice thing. And then you slide in the critical feedback and then you say another nice thing. And people have yeah. very differing opinions. Like some people think it's great. Some people are like, just get to the critical thing. Like, just, right. I don't want this kind of crap that you put around it <laughs> and so then yeah the illustration is just different kinds so cookie dough is just totally unfiltered sugar oh, cookie, yeah, yeah. yeah sugar <laughs> cookie is like it's very sweet and it's only positive but ultimately it's really unfulfilling because like your point you need critical feedback to improve so yeah that's that's one of the kind of jokey illustrations in the book well, so the Oreo method is taught. I mean, there's 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 actually you know HR training manuals that talk about the way to give feedback is, and they some they don't I don't think they use the Oreo method, but they say start with something sweet, something nice, you know, lay a foundation, then lay in the you need to improve this, and then finish with something nice, like oh you know you you look great today or something, yeah, you know, <laughs> which is a lot like bullshit in this in this particular conversation, but. Uh, what do you think about it? What do you think about a, a method like the Oreo method? Yeah, I I don't really have strong feelings about it. I think it I'm more concerned with how the critic or like what is in the critical feedback. And yeah. so um, you know, I, I think the Oreo feedback method can probably be used well. I think it also depends on how people prefer to receive feedback. To me, the most important thing is just like when you're giving critical feedback, whether you're putting two nice things around it or not, is just to make sure it's specific so the person can act on it. And then, and I guess this would be a vote against the Oreo cookie method of feedback, which is make it specific. And then a really nice thing to do is to 
make it clear that you believe the person can make that change you're suggesting and that they have the potential to reach the place they want to be. So specific is important uh, because if it's not specific, you can't do anything with that. So if I just tell you your presentation just really missed the mark, what what does that mean? Like, where yeah. can you go with that? And the only place you can go with it is to spiral into self-doubt and just like go over every single thing you said during that presentation, as opposed to if I say, Slide three, you repeated a lot of the information that you had on slide four. Uh, so by the time you or you repeated what you had on slide two, so it was boring, there was too much text, I would just cut some text, maybe even cut that slide. Really yeah. specific, really useful. And, and it's less likely for you to take that as just like a complete attack on your self-worth or who you are as a person. And then if I also say, I thought that presentation was good. I think it can be a little better with these tweaks. And I really think that you can make those tweaks and then give an excellent presentation. That's kind of the, the nice cookie without, you know, being just like, you look great today. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. What does that have to do with anything? So Oreo cooking, I think if you do it in the right way, as long as it's all still relevant to the work and it's specific, it can work. It, you know, you obviously it's bad if it's again, like, you look great. That's a great sweater. Presentation is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> more authentic. It's more real. Yeah. And you're going to build better trust. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's not the uncooked cookie dough that <laughs> out there, but it's also not the sugary sweet sugar cookie that you're doing. So, right. so Liz, what was the most surprising finding for you as you started doing your research and talking with the executives that you talked with for the book, what kind of surprised you? I was surprised by how poor of an indicator in-person interviews are. Um, like I, you know, I think I, I knew that they probably a lot of it was just based on if I'm similar to you, you like me more. But they seem very bad. Uh, so there's a professor at the Yale School of Management, Jason Dana, and he did this experiment where he had students, they had to predict the GPA the following semester of some of their classmates. And so half the students, again, separated them into randomly into two groups, half the students were only given past GPAs, and then the students' future uh, course curriculum. So that was one okay. group. The second group were given that information. So again, past GPAs and then upcoming course curriculum. But they were also allowed to do an in-person interview for half an hour. And the group that did the in-person interview was way worse at predicting the future GPA. And then the researchers ran it again. And this time in the group that was interviewing people, they actually had the people being interviewed. Half of them, they said, like, answer the question. And the other half, they said, answer it randomly. So if the question ends with like the word ends with an A, then the first thing you say has to start with it, just like total nonsense. And the interviewers didn't really pick up on that. And so I think oh you know, the show, there's lots of research that shows that we make these snap judgments within the first five seconds of someone. And then we just spend the rest of the interview, like confirming what we've already decided. Um, and, you know, and I think there's still valuable things that you can get from an in-person interview, but that study to me was so funny. And I think it just reveals kind of how, how, how biased we can be uh, and how that can, yeah, I, th I think the biggest thing is just that our perception of someone often has nothing to do with whether they're capable of doing a job. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. That, it's really cool. It reminds me of, of a discussion I heard recently when uh, uh, someone who is blind uh, saying, should I put that on an application? You know, I'm, I'm going, I'm, you know, I, I get my I get the work done. Yeah, but I am legally blind. Mm -hmm. And should I let future employer employers know that uh, right up front? Or is that going to, you know, uh, influence them in the way that they think about me? And in, in some ways, that is just the same, or, it, it, or there's a lot of similarities between that and just walking into an interview, and we get judged by the way that we're dressed and how tall we are, and the color of our eyes and our color of our skin, and all those kinds of things influence, you know, so subtly and so uh, unconsciously uh, that could take away from the facts of your ability to, or, or inability to do the work. Totally. There's, there's research that I think has now been replicated for like 10 years or maybe even longer 
um, where researchers, they sent out identical resumes, but one, they had like a very white sounding name. One is the like African-American sounding name and African-Americans get far fewer callbacks. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, it's crazy. Even if we don't think that we're making these judgments, we often are. Yeah. And it's the same. They've done it with, with gender. And so mm. male and female and female again, get, get many less callbacks typically in, in most, yeah. particularly in STEM type approaches and yeah. various mm. different What's next, Liz? What what I'm curious about what's what's ahead for you now that I, or, or maybe this is maybe this is too early after the before, <laughs> you know. But, um, yeah, so the book, I'm kind of excited to see how it's received. Hopefully it's a useful guide for people. And then I am joining a company called Humu, uh, and they are based in Mountain View. It was started about two years ago now by Laszlo Bach who ran people analytics or HR at Google for 10 years. And their team is fascinating. They've done a lot into looking into what makes a good team good. When we say that we like our manager, why, what does that mean? You know, is it like, are there small interactions that the manager is, is having with us? Um, so a really cool study that came out of that team is that if the manager greets a new employee really warmly on their first day and makes them feel a sense of belonging, that person is more productive and more likely to stay at the company. And they're more productive even nine months later, which again, yeah. doesn't seem like rocket science, but it's really useful to be like, Hey, you should take this person out to lunch or just like, don't let all your meetings get in the way of this new hire having a great first day. Um, uh, so anyway, Oh, go ahead. Well, that was from uh, the uh, project Aristotle. Wasn't yes. it? The yeah. That was yeah. Big one. yeah. Yeah. The psychological safety from that too, that whole component of, of what makes a team really an effective team and, that element of creating a psychologically safe workplace or team that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Again, fascinating stuff. Uh, really like what Lazo has done. And I really, have, I've been following Humo since that they kind of made the announcement and it was kind of this uh, it's really interesting too, and how he, he, he announced the company and, and the way that it was all run, but um, that looks, that sounds fascinating. Yeah, so really, sound really fascinating. interested in that. Um, so we'll keep in touch as we're moving forward. Liz, what would you, what would be for our listeners, what would be from the book and the research that you've done, what are two or three things that you could point to that they could maybe take away and apply either in their work life or in their, in their own life that might help improve how they show up at work, how they're showing up in life? Are there two or three things that you might be able to mention for them? Yeah. So the first I would say is if you are having a bad day, whether you're a leader or a manager uh, or you're just in a relationship to flag that for the other person, if it has nothing to do with them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think often let's say that I sit in traffic for two hours and I come in and I'm just going to be frustrated. And if I come in and my employee sees that, they might just immediately perceive that I'm frustrated and then think like, oh, she's frustrated because of me. And what have I done wrong? And if I don't just flag like, hey, just sat in traffic, you know, it was really annoying. Uh, I just need five minutes. If I don't flag that, then it just breeds insecurity in the other person. Um, my boyfriend and I do this too. Like if, if one of us is just grumpy, I'll say I'm grumpy, has nothing to do with you. Whereas before... I would be grumpy and he would think that I was grumpy with him and then he would be grumpy with me. And then I would be like, why are you being grumpy with me? And it would just spiral. So I think having you be grumpy with me. So I think pages, you know. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. And so yeah, it, it can happen. And particularly if you're not understanding. It's funny you say grumpy and you, that you do that with your boyfriend. My wife and I use the exact same. It's like we oh, will talk to each other. I am sorry, sweetie, I'm just grumpy today. And she knows to back off enough and I know to back <laughs> off when she does it. And, and then we don't go that down that downward spiral. That yeah. Should, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's very useful. And then the second one, um, it's a little cheesy, so I want people to bear with me. But we advise people to make what we call a smile file. And that is on your desktop, in your inbox, on your phone, just create a folder and when someone sends you a text or an email, it can be, again, a friend, your boss, your teammate, just thanking you or praising you, just any kind of thing that you receive that makes you feel better, take a screenshot or write it down and save it to that file. And that means when you're having a bad day or when you receive a particularly critical piece of feedback, 
it's going to hurt. Bad days are hard. Critical feedback stings. But if you're able to go back to this kind of directory of really positive data points, you're better able to see it as just another data point in your whole life and in who you are. And so you're less likely to catastrophize the situation. Um, so I think it's, I, I have, I've actually, I read this, uh, I don't even remember where I read it, um, but I started doing that. And it's so like, sometimes I'm not even feeling bad and I'll go back and look at it. Yeah. <laughs> just makes me feel really nice. I get it. And that is just about the cheesiest name that I could ever have. <laughs> yeah. The smile pile. So <laughs> I'm no, I'm just not gonna give you any, any I no. like the smile pile. It's a, it's a it's I, cheesy, I, but thank I, you. I it. <laughs> yeah, super no, it's super cheesy. But I, I'll say this, it's a really good thing to do. Yeah. A really, really good thing to do. We can also and, call it like the positive data cache or something. There you <laughs> go. Oh, I like that. Oh my gosh, that's the smile file. It's much better. You, you, you brought up an interesting point, and I, I wanted to go down this, but you, you said, you know, with the smile file, right? That it, it, when you go in there, um, you're more likely to be able to view that negative feedback or what, you know, however, that the, the, the downward part is just another data point within mm -hmm. your life, as opposed to making it into this this spiraling component of, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm never going to be able to succeed. Um, what, have you, have you done research on that or is any of that research that, that around there that to really point to that, or is this just something that you kind of come up with through trial and error and kind of your own kind of components on that? Cause yeah. I think it's really, in my personal opinion, that that data point is I think the part where we miss, I think we miss that, wow, we got, somebody didn't like the PowerPoint presentation that we did. And now you, we miss that that is actually a good piece of, of information because now in the future we can take that and improve upon it. So, yeah. So I don't, I don't know any experiments around the smile file specifically. Um, but I think you know, there's, there's lots of research that shows that we are, we just tend to fixate more on the negative than on the positive. And it makes sense because if it's a threat, if it's just something that feels really bad, we need to be motivated to fix that. Whereas if everything's going well, whatever, we don't really need to, to, our brain doesn't need us to focus on that as much. There's also, you know, it feels worse to lose a dollar than it feels good to gain the dollar. So it's based yeah. on all of this research um, that really backs up that we, you know, like a wandering mind is an unhappy mind uh, because yeah. it just immediately goes to the negative. Um, so that's, it's supposed to kind of help you step back from this like dirty trick that your mind likes to play on you. Well, I, th I think about the social side of this, uh, the anthropological story of, uh, being in the tribe is that if something is, is wrong and someone accuses me of something mm -hmm. of not, not pulling my weight, they might not take care of me when winter comes or the harvest is shallow or, or there's not enough food to go around. So I want to make sure that I'm in good graces. So there's, I think that there's good psychological reasons for that and of course loss aversion holy cow you yeah know, that um, and and prospect theory that that you know just the way we you know screw things up and thinking and valuing the loss of a dollar more than we value the gain of a dollar is is um, is pretty crazy but yeah. yeah yeah those are those are those are absolutely solid kurt did you have I, I wanted to see if we could talk about music if that's okay <laughs> Of course, I know that we not that we about, talked about music at the oh, beginning, yeah. and you want to bring it into that. But. <laughs> because I, so the big part, you know, this is kind of part of my tribe on this Cat Stevens and Bob Dylan thing. You know, you're you've got all six chords down, so you can <laughs> you can you can nail those. Are you uh, are, are you songwriting at all? Are you getting into um, taking it one step further and saying I can be the next Cat Stevens? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, so, well, well, so recently a little bit so this is a longer story uh so my boyfriend he is a songwriter and writes a lot his so his he's or or no his name is even so but all of his it's like acoustic ex-girlfriend so he has all these songs like about his ex-girlfriend but it's you know it's like very like acoustic guitar kind of similar chords to like a cat stevens bob dylan so now i've recently decided that i'm going to form a cover-ish band called or else <laughs> and so it's gonna be just like me I don't really know what it's yet but it's it's like me kind of making fun of that or like talking about him talking about all his ex-girlfriends and like having to listen to this. 
<laughs> wow. So I, I might it. I might step into songwriting under this new I feel I feel very motivated. <laughs> you guys, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, so, uh, so are what? Boy, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of songs, of uh, uh, titles that are songs about other people's ex exes. You know? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean that's uh, a good one. Just like a song about another person's ex, or like you know, just yeah. like listening to my boyfriend sing about his ex girlfriend. <laughs> Well, that in of itself, I'm like sitting there going, all your songs are about your exes. You know, <laughs> you know that makes me grumpy. You should know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm okay with it. There, uh, you know. Well, you're, there uh, you go. Uh, <laughs> well, I personally went through uh, a, a really strong writing period in, mm-hmm. in my own musical life uh, about uh Two, about a year and a half or two years before I met my wife. Hmm. And so I had this incredibly productive time of lots and lots of songs that, that I thought were, were pretty good songs for the most part. And then, uh, and then I meet Katie and things sort of slowed down for me for writing. And, and, and she was feeling a little nervous, like, whoa, is, is this relationship really as good as I think it is? Because you're not <laughs> writing really as much as you used to. And yeah. That, Someone... That Someone asked my boyfriend recently, like, why haven't you written anything about your current girlfriend? And he's like, I don't know. I'm just really happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. There, 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 there it is. Yeah. Music is, you, know, you think about music and there's, you know, I think probably a lot more sad breakup songs than there are about yeah. happy relationships. Talk about lots of it. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, uh, say again, Lynn. Oh, I was going to say, talk about loss aversion. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I, you know, there's there's very, if, if you look at uh, country music and, you know, country songwriters, they know how to sell a tad, mm. a sad tale. You know, yeah. they can they can absolutely spin that, you know, they can make your roof leak, you know, <laughs> those, those songs. But, but wow. Um, but the happy songs are just harder to come by. Yeah. It's yeah, just, have you gotten back in the swing of songwriting, or I've I've actually been through this this kind of a dip the last few months, and I just decided actually last night uh, after having a conversation with a songwriting buddy of mine in Austin, Texas, that I'm I'm going to get back on the horse. I've got a songwriting partner. We've got a whole bunch of ideas, and we're, we're going to write behavioral science songs. We, we are, are going to do that. that. You know, write oh, behavioral science that. songs. No, no, amazing! I <laughs> can't wait. I didn't. I didn't want to say anything to tee off you know, to tee up this idea with all our listeners. Now they're going to be excited and anticipating <laughs> our, our whole album of behavioral science songs. Yeah, well, which I'm sure Liz knows is a great topic. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for this album. I will say, uh, thank you, Liz. We have one person that all oh, that we're there. Um, all right. Well, with that, Liz, thank you so much for taking time and sharing some insights. And uh, we are looking forward to the book coming out. Actually, the book will probably be out by the time this podcast gets out. Um, so uh, encourage all of our listeners to go out and, and find it. And, and we'll we'll have links in the show notes. And, and yeah, we absolutely think it's a it's a it's a great story. And it's uh, it's well told. That's that's thank an you. important part. So so nice job. Congratulations to you and Molly. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. This was such a fun conversation. <laughs> they they, they meander. <laughs> Our pleasure. Thank you, Liz. All right. Welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our behavior groups interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our emotionally charged brains. Ooh, emotionally charged. Okay, so you got emotionally charged through this, right? This was a this was a really fun discussion. Well, I did, I did. And, and what did think, what did you take away from from this emotionally charged thing? Well, I wanted to be like, emotionally charged brains. It's like the only real relevant brain reference that we ever have had on. Uh, <laughs> On our grooming session. That's what I'm getting emotionally charged about. We talk about stupid things like, you know, hard hat wearing brains or all these others. But emotionally yeah. charged actually is a relative component. And you didn't even pick up on that at the beginning of this whole thing. Yeah, how is that? How did I miss that? You you weren't emotionally in line with where I was going with it. <laughs> that, so, no, I, and seriously, the, um, we are emotional creatures our brains have an emotional component to them it's this not to 
de- degrade. I, it's it's not necessarily system one, system two. Yeah, but that's more decision making. That's decision making and, and how quickly you do it. But but we do have an instinctual component to us. Yeah. We have an emotional element. Our feelings impact the way we think. They impact how we respond to different situations, contexts, well, emotion, environments. Yeah, emotions certainly influence our decision making. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we talk about gut feel. <laughs> you know, gut feel is is that that literally that feeling that we get, you know, in our solar plexus that indicates this is working for me or this isn't working for well, me. Well, and everybody can look at you are going to respond differently to people if you are sad. If you right, come in right. to work, as this is talking about, and you might have just you know, found out that your favorite aunt has just passed away, you are going to show up at work differently. Or if you show up at work mad, right? You got cut off and some guy was screaming at you on the road and there's road rage and now you're at work angry. Yeah, you know the boss coming to you or a coworker coming to you with a request in both of those situations is going to get two different responses. Yeah, I mean, so you're talking about really fundamental emotional responses: sadness, fear, anger, uh, frustration. Joy. Yeah, I, joy, I'm, optimism. I mean, yeah. you can go both love, both, yeah. love both both ends of that continuum, and with that. I think what Liz brings up that I think is really fascinating is, and and relevant, is that we often feel like we have to check our emotions at the door when we when we enter work. Yeah, and that all of a sudden we cannot be the emotional creatures that we have been. You know, evolution has created us to be. So this is interesting that we think about so much of what behavioral, so much of what nudges are about, right? If you think about Sunstein and Thaler's libertarian paternalism, this whole idea of you get to choose, you still get to choose, but we're going to kind of architect the choices that you've got or the way that you make those choices. And so there's this uh, paternalism that says, we think that you should do this. So behavioral science, in some ways, is kind of starting to harness this idea in your decision making. But when it comes to emotions, this whole idea of check your emotions at the door, that has been the norm in the business community forever. Like, right? I mean, for the corporate structure has been built on leave your emotions at home. Well, corporations take a lot from the military in their structure, right? If you look at the hierarchical component and you do any, you know, this is, God, I'm going back to my MBA days. Oh, my God. Uh, This is crazy. How can you remember back that far? I I can't remember last (laughs) week. I have no freaking clue how I can remember back to my MBA days, particularly with as much alcohol as I drank back then. So that's a whole other story. Even more amazing. (laughs) That's a whole other story. The brain is phenomenal. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is, is you think about this, there's a military component in the hierarchy and the, the, the command structure that a uh, traditional, like if you think back to the 40s and 50s in the larger right. organizations, that's right. not saying that's how every organization is structured, but it, we do take a lot from that. And that's the, the historical component. And I think within that military element, they don't allow that emotion, right? Because that emotion can get in the way of the job that they're trying to of, do. Of, of following the orders that were given to you. You're fearful of that order. Well, I don't care. You just do it. You know, you're sad that your best friend just died. I don't care. You still have to go in and we have to make this, we have to, we have to do this job. Um, and I think some of that transferred over. However, I don't think that's necessarily good. I don't think, and I don't, and I think that's what Liz is saying mm-hmm. is that, Whatever that remnant is or whatever that cultural norm of checking those emotions at the door, we have to overcome that and we have to showcase that emotions are actually a positive component. And and as long as we understand that, as long as we're getting to this point, um, we are much more likely to trust somebody if we feel they're being emotionally truthful. With us. Yeah, authenticity, right? Yeah, we can we can we can look at a picture of someone and say they were fake smiling. We yeah, can, we can even see it in a photograph, right? Right. Yeah. And so so with that, and and she tells in her book. So her book is now out. Um, great book, by the way. 
go. I, I just love her drawings. It's yeah, just I know. amazing. And <laughs> they know. just bring all this component in. And, and, and it's really well written and has a lot of really good information in it as well. Um, so big plug for, for, for the book. But with that, uh, one of the first stories she talks about is is Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, mm-hmm. right? And and when he um, he had left as being CEO for a while, and then he came back in, and she talks about when he came back in, how emotional he was, and in his intro speech to the organization, that first time that he got to talk to everybody, he started to cry, right? Which. So he was not checking his emotions at the door. The CEO is shedding tears, and and the impact that that had on the employees and how they they viewed him, uh, I think she talks about is just it, again an amazing component of when we are vulnerable, when we do show our emotions, or at least let people know the emotions that we are having. Right. That is important. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what about you? What really struck me was uh, this, this, what I perceived as a fresh connection between loss aversion that we've talked about a lot, because it is so fundamental to behavioral science, and, um, and the idea that our brains tend to fixate on the negative. Oh, like, yes. Like, it's sort of a big duh for me, but it was like <laughs> really great call out to have Liz just say that, you know? Uh, I what thought, did she say? She said that... Uh, the. Loss aversion, of course, you know, uh, hurting, uh, it hurts more to lose a dollar than uh, it, the joy in gaining a dollar. And uh, it, because our brains fixate on the negative. And that's, is, is that's the, one of the reasons or maybe the main reason why it hurts more. Why loss aversion is there. Yeah. It's like, wow, okay, so so if if we have this fixation on the negative, do, uh, you know, I, I, I thought of myself. I was like, okay, so do I do that? And I thought, you know, there are times when I definitely do that. There's times when I when I focus on, oh, this isn't going to work. You know, or or this is a this is this is going to be bad, and and it is easy for me to do that, but I don't do it all the time. Right. So I wanted to ask you, Kurt. Actually, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you, is 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 your brain like this? Do you do you do you fixate on the negative? So, how, how about looking forward to the future? Well, uh, for the future, probably not. For the future, I am I, I'm a you know, glasses half full kind of guy. I am that. Your, your glasses that, all I full am, kind of guy. <laughs> I am positive thinking <laughs> yeah. about what can we do and all this and we're, it'll work out. You know, we don't, it's <laughs> right. not going to go bad. And even if it does, we'll fix it and we'll be fine. I do. I, I, I do have a big thing though. I, I ruminate on past things that haven't gone right. So, oh. so from that loss aversion component, I spend a lot more time ruminating about things that went wrong than I do ruminating or thinking about things that have gone right, which isn't always, it's not a good thing necessarily. Um, and so like at 2 a.m. In the, in the morning when I wake up, I'm not thinking, oh my gosh, I just, you know, I, I so enjoyed looking at that cat picture today and it brought me so much joy. <laughs> I am thinking about... Wow, that email that I got from the client and how, you know, she wasn't as happy with what we were doing as what she I thought she should be. And right. How, why did we, that happen? And oh my gosh, what's that, you know, how do we fix it? And all of those kind of components. So. Okay. Did you actually say you were happy with looking at a cat picture today? I'm sorry. But <laughs> it I was just the got... first damn thing that came to my mind. <laughs> I don't know. I could be happy about having a conversation with you because that makes me happy. Well, it does. God, isn't, isn't, isn't that the truth? It, it certainly does. But, um, but I, I think that that's really interesting that uh, oftentimes our ruminations are not constructive. They're not no. fixing. They're not. They're not replaying the the old story in order to build a new story. Sometimes it's just going through the same damn story. Right. And and if you think about it from an evolutionary component, um, ruminations actually have a have a, a a role. They they've helped us from a perspective because we can look back and we can examine our decisions. And so hopefully that means that next time we encounter a situation like that, we have explored alternative options, right? Yeah. The, the fact of the matter is, is today we get stuck and we, uh, not today, I think in just, this is just, this is one of the negative components of this is that we tend to ruminate um, overly much and that rumination becomes 
something that we can't escape from. And when we do it too much, it lends itself into depression and anxiety and a whole number, host of other really bad things. And yeah. so yeah. the ability for us to ruminate in and of itself has some positive components about being able to look back, explore, examine what we did, examine what we did right, examine what we did wrong, and 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 build you know counterfactual components around it and thinking through what are different options and how would I handle this in the future and how can I um, solve whatever issues are coming up. When we get to the point where we can't help or we can't stop thinking about something, though, and usually those are those negative aspects, as Liz was right, saying. Right, right. That's, that's, that's bad to our territory. it into a downward spiral. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? What else uh, struck you about, about our conversation so with Liz? So we talked about a, a couple things. I want to talk about um, psychological safety. Oh, uh, bueno. Uh, uh, because we talked about the importance of that element of trust to be able to share our emotions mm -hmm. uh, and how important that is. And, and in order to get that, we need psychological safety. And I thought it was amazing that she's going to work for Hugo for La yeah, for with Laszlo La Block, yeah. who was the guy who wrote about psychological yeah. safety. He was the, the, oh, not the, he didn't run the, the, no. um, but he was, head, he was, head, of he was head of HR that yeah. that was done underneath. Um, so very familiar with it and all of that. So I thought and, that was interesting. Well, and I wanted to call attention to uh, uh, William Kahn in 1990 was was really the first one to start to expose this, uh, this psychological safety thing. Where the hell do you come up well, with this stuff? Know. This is awesome. <laughs> So 1990, like, William Kahn. It's that kiki brain or whatever it's, it's, again. It's, oh, no. <laughs> booba. You're booba. not a booba brain. You are a kiki brain. Sorry, folks. Uh, we digress back to a former episode. And it's. I'm happy to give Google and the, and the, the team that worked on Project Aristotle super kudos for doing the work that they did. Again, their work was standing on the shoulders of people that came before them. And William Kahn, in 1990, his paper, Psychological Conditions of Personal Engagement and Disengagement at Work, was foundational in this. Okay. And so I, I just want to, we'll put it in the show notes, but it's like, gosh, you know, th there are others who have been doing the academic research on this that Aristotle helped support and helped substantiate, basically. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, so great kudos on that. And I think it pretty much if we look at almost all of the research that's being done today, you can go back and you can look and find that it is on the shoulders of others who are on the shoulders of others. You're right. And that that's goes right. back uh, a, a pretty long way. You can way. go back to Kurt Lewin that, or, I yeah. mean, there's And that's not to ideas. say that the ideas that are being you know, put out and put forth today aren't new and important, and important or yeah. revolutionary even, but that they're built upon this foundation. It's the, it's as, you know, when I was writing my dissertation and my uh, advisor was working with me going, look, what you are doing is adding to this body of literature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we often try to think we have to change the world, but no, you can make an incremental little insight into the world and we understand the world a little bit better now. And then people in the future are going to be able to build off of that and build off of that. And so it's this this compounding interest kind of factor of when you get all of these things going. All right, so we digress. Um, Gee, that's a shock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, psychological safety, though, I think as Liz was talking about, in this world where we are open to bringing and sharing our emotions appropriately at work, we need to have psychological trust in order to be able to do that. Right. And right. so that, I think, is a really important component in here. The other piece that we touched on, I don't think we got into it a lot, but is this element that emotions are a contagion. So that, that you come in today and you uh, come into work and you are super happy. That is that's contagious, yeah. and it can it can spread to other members of the organization. Vice, you know, on the on the opposite side, you come in and you're angry or you're you're upset or you're down, 
that can also be contagious and yeah. spread. Which was documented in 1993 by uh, Hatfield, uh, Cacioppo, and uh, Rapson, just FYI. Had to, had to just throw that in. Just got to throw it in. That's why I love you. I can't remember any of that stuff. Anyway. Well, and, uh, uh, and, and you've talked about yawning. Yes, so like I mean, the it, ultimate, right? It, right, and this isn't necessarily an emotion, but it, it but it demonstrates the fact, right? When somebody yawns around you, you are very likely to yawn yourself. Yeah. Is it, oh, don't start! Don't start! Uh, don't start! I'm 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 resisting! I'm resisting! Uh, I'm resisting! Stop it's yawning! Our listeners are yawning right now. They're, they're yawning. <laughs> I think they were probably yawning well, already. And, and that has something. <laughs> If they've made it this far. <laughs> yeah, they're probably asleep by this point. <laughs> um, Wake up. And, and this has something to do with mirror neurons? Mirror neurons, a, a number of different things. So mirror neurons are really interesting from the perspective that we have uh, – the, the neurons in our brain fire even when um, – so the, the neurons that control our behaviors and our actions fire not only when we're doing them – but they fire kind of as a mirror when we see somebody else doing them. So when our, we're, we're seeing somebody doing something, yeah. those same neurons fire in our brain, maybe not to the extent that they do when we do it, but it's the same reason why when they talk about, you know, as um, for sports figures to visualize what they're going to be doing, the, the ski racer going down that hill yeah. and how they make each of their slalom turns, the basketball player, you know, making that shot and visualize it in your head. Part of that is because the that visual, visualization, God, I can't talk, um, fires these neurons in our brains that actually are the same neurons that get fired when we actually do it. So yeah, to a degree, cool. you are practicing um, in an, uh, a, a work environment with this emotional contagion. You see somebody else who is happy those those neurons in your brain that or, you know light up your happiness get lit up when you see somebody down or sad those same neurons in your brain you know get sad and depressed and they they light up and they are more likely to activate when we're being intentional when we're we're focused on something like when we're at work and we're sitting in a at a conference table and we're having a conversation with four or five other people um we're much more in an intentional state than just passing by, you know, sitting four people away from someone else on a train that yawns. Yeah. Someone across the table from us in a conference room in a meeting, it's going to be much more. Stop that. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I, stop that. I, I am resisting. I'm pu- I can feel it. I can actually feel it coming up inside <laughs> it. But, but this um, intentional attunement was something that uh, Vittorio Galese uh, studied uh, at the University of Parma. And he's done some really cool research on, on this idea of how much more profound it is, much more profound... Uh, um, our mirror neurons respond when we're in that mode of sitting, you know, of these intentional exchanges. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, so it, the emotional side of this is uh, the impact in uh, people that are working together on a regular basis, not just in the same building, but working in, you know, in a very intentional way. The emotional experiences, what you bring to work is going to impact the people around you, people yeah. that you are working with, right? Right, right. Yeah. Good. What other, was there anything else from this conversation that you found really kind of insightful, interesting? I love that Liz talked about how she might even become a songwriter because of her boyfriend writing about all the (laughs) (laughs) ex-girlfriends. And it got me reflecting, uh, and this is a segue into music. Oh, uh, imagine that. (laughs) um, That she, you know, uh, that, okay, you and I recently penned a song. We did. On loss aversion. Loss aversion. So, what I found really interesting. I should not sing again. That's the one thing from viewing that vi- that video. No, uh, you're. I I should not. I should just be. I should shake the egg. That's what no, I. No, you're do. a good shouter. You should. You should definitely <laughs> shout. I, I. No, I. I serious. I believe that. Tears for fears. <laughs> shout. Shout. But Let you, it all out. Oh, sorry. oh yeah, no, but they were singers. You're, I think you're a shouter. I think that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you, you. Um, By the way, I'm gonna go down a, a rabbit hole. So no way. Yes, I am. So uh, tears for fears uh, and that song. They yeah. were asked. Everybody uh, wants to uh, rule the world. Yeah, yeah, everybody wants to rule the world. They had a cup. You know, some other. You know, um, love that song. Uh, yeah. Anyway, 
they asked, uh, they were asked by a DJ when they were in an interview, you know, what, what song is your most silly, you know, stupid song that doesn't, and then he goes, everybody wants to rule the world. And the guy goes, what do you mean? It wasn't shout. I mean, you know, if you ever listen to those lyrics, shout, shout, let it all Allowed, out. Yeah. You know, these are the things that I scream about. Um, and they, they said, no, they actually met. So Kurt and I'm going to draw the, the other, the lead singer's name. Anyway, the, the, the two people who form up, um, Tears for Tears Fears, for Fears yeah. met through shout um, therapy uh, oh. back in England. So they were troubled teens, and wow. they went to through therapy that basically had them shout out their emo- I don't know much about shout therapy. I'm making this up just based on the on the words. But this, and so the the song itself is you know if you listen to those lyrics, listen to them through the the viewpoint of shout therapy and that the song takes on a whole different meaning i'll bet so anyway sorry about that little digression that i had we were talking about loss aversion (laughs) we were talking about the song and uh, my mind is still spinning on tears for fears but uh coming back to this idea of loss aversion you actually penned the, the the first set of lyrics you started the lyric and what i thought was interesting about about that the first set of lyrics that you sent me was uh, that they were not clinical, and this was not a description of loss aversion. It was it was about a loss aversion experience in a relationship. Oh, that you framed it in love and loss. You framed it in you framed it in human emotion rather than in. Uh, and, and I I think that part of that is instinctual. My guess is, but I wanted to ask you: Were you intentional? Did you say, "Well, I don't want to write a I don't want to write a song that is." clinical and just describes loss aversion. I want it to have meaning, so I'm going to give it an emotional basis. To, so tell me about, about that. Oh, that's a Wow, you're asking me to think about what I was thinking about? Some metacognition here? Yes! Oh, my God. Metacognition. metacognition. So I don't know if I was that purposeful in my thought patterns around the, okay. the original penning of that. I do think it was... You have to, if you're writing lyrics, and maybe you can talk about this more, is that you need to put that into something beyond just a clinical, right? It's not just a clinical. There's a little bit of a narrative. There's a little bit of a story. Um, And and that part, and I think from the component, um, you, you know, losing you would be, twice as hard for me than the gain or the pleasure that I get from, from having, having you, you around, around is yeah. the, is that initial lyric on that. Um, and I was just trying to, to figure out how do you talk about loss aversion being two times as painful as the element of gain of, of gain. Yeah. Of, of equal. Uh, yeah. Measure, so, yeah. you know, again, loss aversion, I lose a hundred dollars. It's twice as painful as the pleasure that I get from, you know, finding a hundred dollars. Mm. Uh, and songs are always about, you know, people and relationships. And so I think it just fit. Well, it, so when you were first starting to give that explanation, I was thinking you were saying that it was more automatic, more system one thinking, more, you know, reflexive. Um, but it wasn't. You were deliberate. You were engaging system two. It's just that I think I just rationalized after the fact. <laughs> but you weren't. But you, uh, I wasn't going to write. I just think it was interesting. I lost a hundred dollars today. That's twice as painful as finding the hundred dollars yesterday. So, you know? as somebody that's penned a lot of songs, uh, not all of them great songs. Maybe none <laughs> of them great songs, as for that matter. But, but I've spent a lot of time songwriting, and what the way that you came at it was really. Exactly the way a good songwriter needs to approach writing a song. There needs to, you said it, you, there needs to be a narrative. Yeah. There needs to be a story that we connect with. Well, and the story doesn't have to be linear and it doesn't have to be actually, uh, I, I think of all of the songs where you go, what the hell are they talking about? Yeah, right? yeah. And, and, and to a certain degree, there's an element of poetry in, included in songwriting. And, and poetry doesn't always have a, a single 
um, translation or interpretation. Right. And I don't think songs do either. And so that narrative doesn't necessarily mean it's a story. It's not a country song, right? Where it's like you, <laughs> you know, you've I, used the, the... I woke up, I turned, I, I got out of bed, I put my slippers on, I walked toward the bureau. I, yeah, it, yeah it's, it, it's not it, that it specific. It isn't that. And, that and literate. There's, yeah, so I think there's a lot of emotive visualizations that happen. I think there are a lot of elements that you can you can bring but you know that's I, i'm not a songwriter no you are a songwriter but that's you are where i i see songwriting going so. you do you just did it yeah. you just we we wrote a song together and uh, i love the idea that the the first concept for the for the lyrics came from you in the form of a narrative about love yeah there you go it was perfect All it right. was like yes i get this <laughs> We are running long. <laughs> A big shock. Huh? Okay. <laughs> All right. So with that. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you have enjoyed this, please uh, tell a friend. Um, if you want to see anything on the uh, uh, Tim and me performing Loss Aversion live we'll, we'll at the put Brave in the show New notes. Workshop, we can click through or just Google Loss Aversion. Um, that, that's pretty much all music, you Music. Yeah, uh, on YouTube. On YouTube. Uh, and, and we're out there. So with that, thank you and keep, keep on, on grooving. grooving.